Hey everyone, this is Kayla with Damn the Diets. And today I have the honor of talking with Tabitha Farrar. And so I've been requested to talk with you, Tabitha, by a couple of people. And I've been wanting to talk to you for a while myself as well. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, real pleasure. Okay, so um, I have several questions from the people in my Facebook group that um, they wanted to ask you if you could answer that for us. But mm -hmm. before we start, do you mind giving just a little background about how you fell into an eating disorder because I heard you mention before that it necessarily wasn't on purpose and it kind of just happened naturally as a no yeah it kind of it kind of was on purpose but not on purpose for the main reasons that people lose weight um so I was 17 I was I was at least 17 and a half nearly 18 and um been a I've been a horse rider and then um especially sort of event horse riding since I was very young and over that summer, I um, just to earn some extra money, I started working for a local racehorse trainer, just um, just exercising the horses, so so jockeying them on on the gallops and exercising them. And quite sadly, actually, the racing industry starts horses very young, like two years old, which I don't like that part of it at all. I've always really hurt my heart <laughs> to see these really young horses. And um, this new horse came in called Kit Kat, and I fell in love with her. She was so gorgeous. And she was just two and kind of naughty and beautiful. And but she was small and because of her age as well, I think. Um, I was, you know, I would have been a little bit heavy to ride her because I'm quite tall. And so it was a case of, oh, I could, you know, if I lost five pounds, then it really was a small amount. But I was like, I don't get to ride Kit Kat. And it really was that simple. And um, being young and naive and never, I'd never thought about dieting. I knew nothing about it. I really had my head completely was just in horses my whole life. I had never thought about dieting. And um, I was just sort of like, oh, I'll just not eat for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> it, that, that, that not eating for a couple of days and losing a couple of pounds triggered anorexia for me. Uh, because of not getting enough nutrients and energy, it actually changed your brain. Correct. Right, right. So if we if you look at the genetics of, of anorexia, and it seems that when a person with those genetics goes into energy deficit, sorry, the cats are fighting behind <laughs> me. Um, when a person with anorexia goes into energy deficit, then the brain detects that that's what's happened, and you know they um, the anorexia response is triggered, which meant that by the time I'd lost that five pounds, and I thought part of my brain was thinking, oh great good, I can like, I don't have to do this anymore. And then I just remember going to the fridge, opening it and feeling completely like my appetite just vanished. Mm. And I was like, it wasn't really, you know, it, it was very uh, innocent in a sense. Cause I thought, oh, I'm just not that hungry. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't force myself to eat if I'm not that hungry. And of course I've had people commenting on that couple of pounds that I'd lost saying, you look great and all this encouragement. So I thought, well, if I'm not that hungry, I'll just like carry on and not eat very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, big mistake. I feel like that's why a lot of people don't even know that they have eating disorders is because they go into it, you know, innocently. They're not really um, maybe um, trying to lose no. weight or diet. And then they just, it triggers that in the brain. And then later down the line, I'm like, oh shit, like, I exactly. actually have an eating disorder. And, and when that's triggered, it actually feels very intuitive and natural not to eat. I really didn't feel like I was doing anything wrong. I didn't feel like I was doing anything stupid. It just felt like I'm not that hungry. And there was also, it felt sort of marginally rewarding not to eat. And it felt like a good, I felt good and energetic and um, almost inspired by not eating as much. And so I continued it on. Now, of course, if I knew then what I know now, Oh yeah. gosh, I would have forced myself. And if I could go back in time, I would have forced myself to eat. Because I think if I'd done it then, I think it would have just been a little blip. You know, it wouldn't have progressed into what it then became. Okay, yeah, exactly. So w what you mentioned, a lot of people ask this actually, they're like, um, well, what do I do if I don't have an appetite? Like I literally don't have an appetite. How do I go into recovery? How do I recover from my eating disorder? I don't even have an appetite. Mm -hmm. And suggestion just to 
force feed yourself oh, yeah because yeah. when when if you think about say if, if you imagine or if you think about the anorexia as your body responding to what it thinks is a famine in the environment and your appetite's going to go. What's the point in giving you physical hunger cues if there's no food around? Your body's not going to do that. A physical hunger cue costs the body energy to give us. So if, there's no, if it doesn't think there's enough food around, it's not going to waste energy by giving hunger cues when you can't eat, you know, if, if it's perceived famine anyway. So most of us don't get the luxury of, of having an appetite, especially early on in recovery. You've just kind of got a force feed anyway. Um, yeah. And the appetite will come because then your brain will go like, oh, there is food in the environment. I'm really hungry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's like in my recovery. Um, that's what happened. People are like, well, when did it happen? When did you just choose recovery? And it's like, I didn't even choose recovery because I didn't even think I had a problem. I just, yeah. it just happened because I had that first bowl of like pasta and cheese and stuff. And it just triggered something in my brain and body to be like, oh my gosh, we're not in a famine anymore. You need I'm to eat. Starving. Binge. Yes. <laughs> and yes. So then you go on like a several month long binge or whatever. Yeah. So, Which is the best thing for you. Yeah, exactly. Don't be afraid of the food and the extreme hunger, you know? And so what was the turning point when you were able to go into recovery? Or? Well, that was a long time later. Oh, okay. um, I think I was, it was, I was around 26, 27. No, I made, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a good 10 years later. And, um, I, it was more to do with exhaustion, just sheer exhaustion. I had a high um, exercise addiction component, mm -hmm. uh, compulsive exercise. And so I was physically exhausted from that, but mentally exhausted because I also had a high OCD element to my anorexia. So very ritualized days, busyness during the day, all of these rules that I had to do that some of them were food related, but not all of them, most of them were movement related. And it, it's incredibly tiring. And so I was exhausted, but I was also very lonely um, because most people with anorexia know it's not the most social of illness. And I think I was, I was getting to my, I was getting to that stage in my life where a lot of my school friends are sort of noticing they were getting married and starting to have children. And I felt like I'd just completely, yeah, done nothing for, which in a sense I had done nothing apart from exercise and not eat very much. And I'd done nothing other than fulfill my little rituals and routines for however many years. And I was incredibly lonely. Um, I was not in a good place mentally for, um, and a lot of people sort of give the, oh, I got to rock bottom um, type analogy. And I think that that was somewhat true for me, but I also don't think that that's required for a person to go into recovery. And I feel it's unfortunate actually that a lot of us get to the point where that's what pushes us to go into recovery. Um, you don't need to be that low in order to start eating more food. Uh, I did also didn't have any information. This was before recovery blogs were a thing. This was before any, there was no, inf I, I never even read an anorexia book or recovery blog or anything like that. So it was before I, I really had um, any clue what I was doing and I just was so exhausted and there was a part of me that just wanted to eat all the food. Hmm. And I think that in a sense, a lot of recovery is, is that you stop resisting the food. You stop pushing it away and just recovery is a bit more like surrender, just like, fuck it, I'm just going to eat everything. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. And just committing and letting go. Yeah. Yeah. And of course that didn't make it easy. I was still terrified and I ate crying a lot. Mm. And it was this weird dynamic of really wanting the food, but then still having to force feed myself. Cause when it got to the food, I was like, Oh, suddenly I don't want it anymore. <laughs> and then it's like, no, you're going to eat it. So I, I did have to force feed myself and I ate many meals early on crying my eyes out. And it gets well, how did you do that? How did you stick with recovery without like, cause I know maybe for some people, what keeps them going and committed is having the knowledge to continue to read and like put in their right. mind how did you do that and how did you I did not... have I did have some knowledge I, I found the feast website and I've okay. written about feast a lot and it's in my book and it was a really fundamental part of my recovery and that was really the only that was the first time I sort of even google searched anorexia or started to look at things like that and the first thing that came up was thank god the feast website and um I, I got onto the forum there um, and I, I didn't ever post, I don't think. I only read and I was reading, it's for parents, it's about parents refeeding, refeeding children. And I was reading all these parents' struggles and what 
the advice they were giving each other, sort of like sit down at the table and telling their children things like, life stops until you eat, you're not leaving the table till you eat, and not allowing the, um, their children to get out of eating at all. And it just kind of clicked in my brain, like, oh, I have to do that to myself. So I had to sit myself down at the table, and I wouldn't. I'd sit there, I'd put a plate of food there, and I'd just say, you're not leaving until you've eaten all of it, even if it took hours. And people with anorexia, most, most tend to be really quite great at being determined. And yeah. once you've set your mind to doing something, it's going to get done. So I sort of knew that about myself. And I knew that if I put a plate of food down and just didn't give myself an out, I would end up eating it. Um, so I, I did have that guidance. That was the one thing that sort of helped me with the, because it's really confusing, right? Like I, I could feel this immense hunger, but then as soon as I went and got the food or even thought about buying the food, suddenly a part of my brain would be like, oh, you don't need pizza, actually. Just stick to the salad that you usually eat. Mm -hmm. And so it was really confusing because you don't know which one's right. Mm -hmm. And so in reading that website and reading about just getting loads of food into these children and not allowing them to back out of eating, that was able to help me go, oh, that part's right. I've got to stick with the part of my brain that wants to eat all of the food. And then I have to follow through, which was the hardest part. That was the follow through was difficult, but, um, and that's not ideal. And I don't think um, nowadays, I don't think that's required that someone would have to do that on their own because you can get online meal support. You can get you, like peer support groups. You don't have to have expensive professional support to have some proper kind of one-on-one -on -one support nowadays, which I think is fabulous because it really wasn't ideal for me to have to try and do that myself. Um, but even if you are on your own, you can still do it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And um, that's what you do too, is you help a lot of people one-on-one. -on -one, right? As a coach, yeah. That's awesome. I think it's great just to have guidance, but also what you say is, you know, everyone's recovery journey is so unique. So I know, yeah. And this, this, is, this is what I think the only downside of all of these recovery blogs now, and YouTube stuff and podcasts, the only downside is that people listen to someone else's story and think, oh, well, it worked for them, so that's exactly what's going to happen to me. And it's not. Yeah. And I've even had people write to me an email saying, well, you recovered on your own, so is that the right way to do it? And I'm like, fuck no, there's no right way to do it. <laughs> like, yeah. that was just what I was given. That's what I had to do. You've got to look at your individual situation and say, okay, well, what's, what's in my life? Who can I use in my life? And if there's no one, you might just have to rely on what you can get. Like, how can you fill that space? If even if it's online, if you can't afford professional support, then find it in peer support. There's always an option there if you think, if you kind of like really try and make it work. And you've also got to look at what you know about yourself and what you know about your eating disorder, because you have all the information about your eating disorder right there in your past history. And so I think that that's so important that people understand that, that we can learn from each other's stories, but you have to understand you're an individual. Exactly. Um, and everything's unique. And this is the whole thing is to get away from comparing. I think for some people, what got them into this is because they were comparing to someone else's body or diet mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's getting away from that mindset of comparing. So now it's comparing to someone else's recovery and how yeah. they did it and how they live now after recovery. And it's just like, stop comparing and find your journey right and because the, the the tricky part with that as well is that we all um we all kind of make mistakes in recovery and that's vital because you can't learn from something unless you kind of mess up a bit and go oh that didn't work that well I won't do that again next time yeah. and that's a really important part of learning and, and learning actually how to sustain recovery is having these little blitz mm -hmm. and rather than going oh I suck I can't obviously can't do recovery so I'm not going to bother just actually looking at it and thinking, okay, well, that didn't work out. So what can I put in place next time so that it's easier? That's actually how you learn. And I think that that's such an important part of it that it can be, you can lose that if you try to just follow someone else's method to the T and don't allow yourself to experiment and make mistakes and then learn from it. Um, and of course, you have to be really, you know, if you are physically in an unstable place, then you have to do everything to get yourself out of that and get yourself physically stable, which usually means eating a ton of food. Yeah. And there's no, there's no mistakes to be made in that. If you're eating food, you're doing it right. Great. Exactly. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, but I wanted to get back onto some of these questions because this is great, but okay. 
Um, Cause we have about like, well, let's see how much we can get to, but I wanted to um, address this one first because you were just talking about exercise and how you were, um, you know, pretty heavy into exercise and like um, abusing exercise. So someone was asking about exercise and recovery. And so when they're just like a sport level, a lover from childhood, and if you're afraid to lose your whole progress and shape within recovery. So um, how do you approach exercise and recovery? Um, okay, so I'm gonna start by saying exercise is not the enemy. And if you get fully recovered, then the whole point of full recovery is you then get to choose. Because when you're fully recovered, you won't have an exercise compulsion. So you will know that if you decide to do something, then it's just because you wanna do it. When you're not fully recovered and when you're in recovery, then what tends to happen is that exercise and food become linked in your brain. And they shouldn't be linked. They should be independent things. It should not be the case that you think about what can I eat today based on how much exercise I did. That's an example of them being linked. It shouldn't be the case that you think, I'm going to go out for pizza tonight, so therefore I'm going to go to the gym this afternoon. They should not be linked. And when you have an eating disorder, they often become linked. So we have to unlink them and you have to get them completely unlinked, independent before you can actually have a healthy relationship with exercise. And so you've also got to remember that physical uh, malnutrition is a huge physical insult on the body. And although you might feel well or feel, you feel fine, like many of us don't feel the effects of malnutrition. And that's been documented even since, um, even in Minnesota starvation study, it was noted that the people, despite having quite large effects of malnutrition, such as reduction in the size of their heart, and all of these things after even a short period of malnutrition, they didn't necessarily feel unwell. So you can't necessarily use the fact that you feel fit and healthy to say that you are, and that's to do with anosognosia as well, and we don't really know how sick we are. Um, and so, malnutrition is a huge insult on the body and you've got to I used to just put myself in the position of well imagine that I had something like cancer would I be sitting there going oh I don't want to lose my biceps though I don't want to lose the fitness that I built like I'm not going to do I'm not going to do recovery I'm not going to recover from cancer actually because I want to like keep my level of fitness you just wouldn't do that would you so but the reason that we do that is because we are not respecting how bad malnutrition is for the body and how important it is to allow the body to rest and recover. This is a serious illness. Malnutrition affects every single part of your body, whether you can feel it or see it or not, that has happened. And um, I've known too many people have heart attacks who were felt fine, but you know, anorexia reduces the size of your heart. It's, it's a big deal. And so it's a bit like you've got this body, which is, should be in an invalid state, and you're making it go and work out, <laughs> that's crazy. So yeah. the justification of, oh, I don't want to lose my level of fitness. Well, yeah, keep your level of fitness. You might die of a heart attack. <laughs> like, or take some time off, take a year off, get fully recovered, and then you can do whatever the fuck you want when you're fully recovered. That's the whole point. Because when you're fully recovered, exercise, movement, and food will be unlinked. You won't sit there and eat them like, you won't be thinking, what can I eat today? Because I moved. It just won't, your brain won't do that anymore. And that's kind of how you know. Yeah, exactly. You, you have the rest of your life to exercise and exercise is for healthy people. It's great for healthy right. people, but when you're malnourished, like that's the last thing you want to do, especially when you're trying to feed and nourish and heal and you're in taking all this energy from the food and then it's going towards muscle repair and right. not towards healing. Yeah, exactly. And there's also, if you look at... Um, migration science with animals and i think of anorexia as a migration response your body thinks it's in famine and it wants to move a lot it wants to migrate it wants to get to where the food is and animals do it as well so when they go into energy deficits certain breeds of animals then want to start to migrate when they start to migrate they don't want to eat because they're like got to move can't stop and eat and that's how, what happens when animals migrate another thing that happens when animals migrate is their pain threshold goes up and they don't feel tired because if you think about a bird that's got to fly from the UK to Australia to migrate, it can't just stop because its wings got tired. <laughs> so your pain threshold goes, goes um, up and you don't feel as tired. And so I think that's really difficult for a lot of us to navigate because 
we don't necessarily feel as physically tired as our bodies are. Uh, so that's all kind of buffered for us by that migration response. But your body is tired. That's why for most of us, when we do stop exercise, give it a couple of days or a week and suddenly you're knackered. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so true and then people blame it on that you know they're doing something wrong or something oh that the food's bad for me yeah. it's the food that's making me feel tired yeah. no it's you've always been tired your body's just suddenly gone oh we're not migrating anymore thank god i'm exhausted exactly and that's, that's yeah. so interesting i love that i love how you connect all of this back to you know nature <laughs> we're so disconnected from that Right. And we, I often think that we forget that we're mammals yeah, I know. <laughs> like, and this anorexia happens in animals as well, which, yeah. and, and it's very interesting when you look at the animal studies. And for me, it was like, Oh, great. I'm just like that pig that starts pacing its pen when it's not given enough food and won't eat. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's quite humbling. It is. It's so, yeah. And that's why, um, you know, I don't understand why a lot of like these diet trends are, you know, actually justifying the being able to um, shift gears and use different nutrients as or macronutrients as fuel, but it's just like a survival mechanism. It's not a way to thrive. You know, it's not how we're meant to do long term. It's really messed up, isn't it? Yeah. We're actually forcing our bodies to go into a state of stress. You yeah. think about Famine, perceived famine is very high state of, state of stress for your body because humans have evolved over thousands of years and there wouldn't have been McDonald's and there wouldn't have been stores on every corner for a lot of that. So the brain is like, is evolved to think of, of famine as a very stressful circumstance. And then this, we, many diets purposefully put, put the brain into that state of stress and kind of um, take advantage of that. Yeah. And they say, oh, well, you'll live longer or, you know, having a lower metabolism is better for your health and mm -hmm. all of these starvation um, symptoms mm -hmm. they're using as being healthy. And so it's just... Yeah, but humans do some really crazy stuff. <laughs> Especially nowadays. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes we know too much. Or we, we, think, think, we think we do. We think we know too much. That's the problem. We, it's supposed mm -hmm. to be just, you know, instinctual. But on that exercise question again, I, I absolutely had that thought. I could run, I, I spent years running and a big part of me not wanting to give up running was thinking like, if I stop running, I won't be able to start. I'll never be able to get up to this length of running again. And guess what? I have no desire to get to that length of running again now anyway. That yeah. was just kind of, I think that um, when, you, when you're in recovery, anorexia there's all these tiny little thoughts that act like hooks as to why i can't do something and then when you get if you just ignore them all and do it anyway when you get out the other end you're like i can't believe i was worried about not being able to run for however many hours a day uh -huh. it's just all those little things that seem so important when you're actually in recovery or trying to make that decision just feel like nothing yeah nothing to worry about yeah, become, you become hyper-focused, and then after you have so much more to use your brain power and energy and time right. on. Too. Yeah. I remember um, when I was in the bikini competitions and all of the prep, and um, so I looked fit, and people looked to that as being healthy and fit, right. but right. like, I couldn't, I was so weak at that point, mentally, physically drained. I couldn't even do a squat without wanting to just sit on the ground. I, I was know. so tired. Yeah, I know and the feeling. So yeah, it's like what you said with running and then you get to the point after, after you're recovered and more healthy and um, then it's like you have more strength and endurance to actually be active anyways. Mm -hmm. as you were back then starving yourself right. looking healthy yeah and and you also have the ability to genuinely make that choice yes um, yeah. and i have genuinely made the choice that i don't like running yeah exactly <laughs> exactly i know i used to try all the hit work at the high intensity to where you want to puke and just it's torture and it's just yeah. why? why why yeah yeah I'm, I'm a much happier person for not having any gym or any formal yeah. exercise in my life. Yep, same. Yeah. Uh, okay, on to the next, because there's quite a few. So how do you feel about treatment teams insisting on following meal plans and adding calories slowly and 
uh, watching the progress to um, accordingly, oh, to adjust accordingly to weight gain and any explanations or truth to this? Okay, so there's many questions in that one. Yeah. Um, we'll start with thought, the sorry? Uh, we could start with the weight gain one or whatever you feel inclined to first. Adhering to a meal plan, well, with everything, I think it, it really has to be dependent on the individual. So I have worked with some people who, because we have a fight, flight, or freeze reaction a lot of the time to eating more food. I've worked with some people who have had such a strong freeze reaction that they can't actually eat food unless it's put out initially on a meal plan. And so that might be a place to start, but the message always has to be that as soon as you can and when you feel able and if you're brave enough, that the real work is when you start eating over and above what somebody else has given you permission to eat. Because that's the big thing with a meal plan, isn't it? It's someone external saying, giving you permission to eat. And nutritional rehabilitation is required for anorexia recovery, but the second part of it is rewiring the neural pathways in your brain that anorexia has set up. And no one else can do that for you. So if your dietitian says, eat this piece of chocolate cake, I'm giving you permission, and you eat it, that's great that you ate it. But if you are the person that you just walk past a shop and you see some chocolate cake and you're like, I want that, you giving yourself permission to go and eating it is starting to rewire those neural pathways that for so long have not allowed you to give yourself permission. And it's a hundred times harder, <laughs> which is why it's, you know, it's usually the hard work is the good work. And so I think that meal plans can be a stepping stone, but they should only ever be treated like that. And as soon as someone can actually authentically respond to their hunger, be it mental or physical, that's where the work starts. Because your body is telling you what it wants. And just because your anorexia brain disagrees with what your body is telling you, doesn't make it any less true that your body's telling you what it wants. And so, you know, for me, that was the realization, especially early on in recovery, all my body was telling me it wanted was sweet carbohydrates in huge amounts and it took me a lot to mentally kind of get be able to deal with that and give into that and just say you know what I want to eat sticky toffee pudding and ice cream all day today and that's what I'm going to do <laughs> um, and just trusting that my body knew what it was doing um, and that what I was craving changed throughout recovery but nobody can tell you like no no dietitian would have been able to tell me yeah you want to eat trays and trays worth of sticky toffee pudding today. No dietitian is going to tell me that. I had to recognize that and give myself permission to do it, whatever it was that I was craving that day. So I think that that's the really important part there. And it's, it's understanding the neural rewiring part. It's not just nutritional rehabilitation. It's neural rewiring as well. And yes. that's you making decisions. Yes, exactly. I remember um, in my recovery, just wanting donuts so bad, specifically donuts. And I just was still holding on to whole foods only. I can only eat whole foods. So um, I would go and eat thousands more calories of all these other foods to try to compensate my craving for just and you having still donuts. Want the donuts. Yes, <laughs> they still wanted the donuts, even though I had all of this other stuff. Yeah. And it's just like there was something in that. I just needed to listen to the body, and maybe I could have had just a few donut donuts and moved on with my day. You know? Right, right. But it's it's so that's that's the. But, but I also think that people get like, oh, well, she's saying, now she's saying that if I'm following the meal plan, then I'm not doing recovery and that's wrong. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you have to do what's right for you at the present moment. Because it might be that today you need to follow a meal plan. It might be that tomorrow you're feeling ready to move off from that. So you also have to be able to adjust and just say what's right for me right now. What's going to get me eating the most food right now? Because that's the right answer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's more of a guide, a meal guide. Yeah. to guide you like okay like you said you have permission to eat all of this today but if you want something outside of this then please do that yeah and that, that's one of my big beefs with treatment centers and i've asked I've, I've visited plenty of treatment centers and i've asked their dietitian there so what would happen say if you know if someone's on your highest meal plan and they're still hungry what if, if they can if they come and say to you that they're still hungry what would happen and the most recent answer that i got was well i can we'd consult with the team and, and decide whether we thought if it was appropriate or not for them to have more food in which at the point I wanted to walk out because I'm like appropriate there's somebody there in malnutrition with anorexia and you would be deciding if it's appropriate for them to eat more food even if they didn't have anorexia or not if someone is hungry if their yeah. body is saying I want more food it's appropriate for them to eat more food 
yeah. not for somebody outside of that person's body to say, no body, you've got it wrong. I trust you. I know better because I'm a dietitian. Yeah. Exactly. Our minds think that they know so much more than the body and the body just is here to, you know, uh, deceive us or, you know. Right. No, this thing's been around for thousands of years. It knows its job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the communication tool to us. It doesn't have verbal communication, but that's a communication signal, hunger. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but that leads us into the next question right there of doctors and treatment teams being afraid of weight gain and warning. I know, I know. I can't tell you the, because if, if I work with a client, if they have a nutritionist, if they have a dietitian, if they have a therapist, I'm always for like, let's do this as a team. I want to work with these people as well. And I can't tell you the amount of times I've had to handhold someone's therapist or someone's dietitian through the process of that person actually gaining weight. Like all the kind of like, are you sure this is okay? Are you sure that, oh my gosh, it's incredible to me actually. And quite scary. <laughs> yeah. Is it, what do you think that is? Is it that they haven't gone through recovery themselves and they're not understanding what this is? I think it's just really against the grain, uh, especially if it's a dietitian and, and especially if somebody got, starts to put on weight and they're doing great and they get past that magic BMI 19 and they get past BMI 20 and I'm still there going, they're cool. Their body's doing its thing. You just let it roll. And then they start to get nervous and be like, is it going to stop? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And that's funny that you say that because I just got a question the other day about someone saying um, that, you know, they got to BMI 20, so they feel that they're at, you know, their weight restored. So now they don't want to keep gaining. So, you know, they're wondering like what to do next. And it's... Well, there's, you know, the body, your body decides when it's weight restored. It's as simple as that. If your body wants to keep gaining weight, that's because it believes or it knows that gaining weight is optimal for it. And I think that we need to remember that the body's only agenda is health. Your body hasn't got this secret agenda to make you super unhealthy. It wants to get to an optimum place of health because that's how it survives the longest. And usually our bodies do great at that until we start fucking around with it and start trying to tell it like how, to, how it should do health. And so I think that it's, it's just trusting that if your body decides that you need to be a BMI 26 to be healthy or higher or 30, whatever, then that's what you need to be to be healthy. And I think that most people, if you look through family history, genetics and things like that, you can kind of tell where from in your family set, what body type you have. And that may not be a BMI 19 or 20. And if that's the truth, then every time that you are not allowing yourself to eat, not allowing yourself to gain weight, not allowing your body to get to where it needs to be or suppressing your weight by exercise, you are doing just that. You are suppressing your body weight. And suppressed body weight is not healthy body weight. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really difficult for a lot of treatment providers to also understand that suppressing people's health, uh, suppressing people's body weight is suppressing their health as well. Yeah, exactly. I um, remember in recovery. So like, for example, when I was at, I didn't really ever see if, what BMI I was at that point, but um, it was at a really low weight. And then um, I thought like, oh no, I don't need to gain any more weight, but I was still underweight at that point. And now getting past that point, like a couple of years later and seeing like, oh yeah, I definitely needed to gain more. But it's just that your eyes, your mind has been so, you know, familiar with your lower body weight. It's hard to even fathom or mm -hmm. see yourself at any higher weight. So it's yeah. this adjustment phase. I think it's, it's really, it's very difficult for, as a, per, for a person in recovery to deal with the weight gain and then and deal with more weight gain. And then the last thing that we need then is the professional support getting cold feet and starting to make noises of like, oh, you should be careful. Yeah. Don't yeah. Any more weight. That stuff. It's hard enough as it is without having other people start to like get, get nervous. Exactly. Yeah. And that was the other part of the question is, you know, um, them warning people in recovery not to gain too fast or, you know, to eat. No, I think their body's like got this down. If it wants yeah. to gain fast, then I gain very fast in a short space of time. Um, it's not, and a lot of people think that, because I talk about unrestricted eating a lot, and a lot of people seem to have this idea that I went into unrestricted eat eating at a really low weight. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. I was around BMI 18.5, 19, when I really kind of clicked in my head what under unrestricted eating meant and to open those floodgates. And 
because I think at a much lower weight, like my brain just wasn't there yet. I couldn't fathom that. My brain could not get on board with understanding that. Um, and I, I got my weight up through kind of restrictive eating more, but still restricting massively and binge eating at night. And I did that for four years and I got my weight up to that almost healthy weight range. And I was still massively messed up in my head and really, really unhappy. And so I've been there for four years before suddenly I clicked and went, you know what, I'm just going to eat everything. And I did that. And I gained weight really quickly for that little like short space of time. Um, at, at that space where, uh, did you stop exercise completely for a while? I, yeah. Yeah. I'd actually stopped way before that, but that didn't stop me being in a binge restrict cycle for ages. Mm -hmm. Okay. So stopping exercise made things a lot better, but um, it wasn't like uh, I kind of like stopped exercise and then realized that there was another piece to it and it wasn't eating healthily. <laughs> it was allowing myself to eat without restriction. Um, yeah. And so at that time I'd done both. I was cold turkey on exercise and I was eating tons and tons of food, just allowing myself to eat whatever I wanted. And the re it, it did happen quickly comparatively you know like comparatively i've been treading water for four years and then it, it happened really quickly but my body took care of it it knows what it's doing it just wants to get to health and so i don't think that we should um limit the body's capacity to do that once you're past the risk of refeeding syndrome then i don't see any reason to limit the amount of food that you should eat artificially you mm -hmm. should really completely eat to hunger so what's your take on refeeding syndrome if you're dealing with someone um, that's going through that? Or what is your take on refeeding syndrome? Oh, they, you need to be working with professional. Like that's, it's, if you are, at, if you've been restricting to that extent, your body weight is that unstable and low that you're at risk from refeeding syndrome, you should probably be an IP. Okay. Um, but that's not everybody's reality, unfortunately. And I've worked with some people in countries where IP doesn't exist, mm -hmm. for example. So uh, it's just kind of like getting them so that they're seeing their doctor really, really frequently. And then you do have to kind of like stagger up the, uh, the intake slowly and carefully. But then once someone's passed a certain amount of food a day for like over a week, mm -hmm. then you're past that, you're past the risk of refeeding syndrome. And anyway, Studies have shown that there is actually really, really low percentage of people that get that. Mm. We do have to be careful because, of course, it's really dangerous, but it's such a low percentage of people. And I think that sometimes um, it's, we're, we're erring, like treatments erring on the side of caution too much mm. and being like um, taking too long to get people's intakes up and get them actually eating. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about refeeding syndrome when I recovered, so yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I didn't know what that was. So yeah, same because I did it like on my own, and I probably I don't know if I had it or not, but you know mine was bad. I just my whole body was so depleted and like mm. edema. I felt like I was gonna pop and yeah, but yeah, I didn't know about it until like a few months later when I found right. on all the information about eating disorders too. So and that's why I'm. Um, um, I think that nowadays that is better sort of medical doctors that understand eating disorders and, and you can actually get that, that sort of help uh, easier and it's more widespread, I think. But it's, it needs to be taken seriously, but it also then can't be taken so seriously that the person's just not allowed to just eat when they're really past the risk of that, which most people are past the risk of it. Do you think back in the day, according to, you know, the migration theory and all of that, do you think, what would they have done back in the day if they got refeeding syndrome or how do you think? They would have probably died. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I think, okay, so here's something. I think that say if anorexia was a migration response, then the design, the design would not be to last years. The design would be to last a couple of weeks or a month or so to get you out of the famine. And then if you imagine you're migrating with this big tribe of people, because the whole village has got to migrate mm -hmm. and everybody's going. And, you know, if you do develop anorexia, then you're going to migrate really well. You'll be the best migrator out there. And you'll get to where the place with your tribe is. And when you get to where the buffalo are or wherever the food is, everybody will be feasting. Everybody will, because everybody will be starving. Mm -hmm. So it would just be like this big feast fest and i think that what really stalls a lot of us in recovery is the fact that everybody around us isn't eating as much as we need to eat and we compare to everyone else if you imagine that the, everybody around you was just stuffing their faces with food i think it would be really easy 
to actually allow that feast to come. But the whole point of that being that you, migration wouldn't last years like anorexia does for many of us. Migration would last just as long as it was needed to get to where the food was, which wouldn't, I'd hope, be a long time. So I think that the person's body wouldn't be in such a severe state of malnutrition as many of us who have been migrating for years and years and years have it. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. That makes complete sense. Yeah, there's like a new phenomenon that we've added to the whole picture. Right. So how, um, how to, how, someone was asking, how to tolerate or accept your weight gain and a bigger body shape with curves? How do you go about that with pe helping people develop a new healthy body image? I think it's one of the hardest bits and it takes the longest. For most people, I think that it's between six and 12, in my experience, for most people, it's between six and 12 months post nutritional rehabilitation that they actually start to feel better about being in their bodies. And I think a lot of that, so I never had body dysmorphia or I never had negative body image. I was, I was, but I've always been like, my whole family is on the slim side. That's like, I do have thin privilege as a natural thing. Um, and which is even why it's even more ironic because I didn't need to lose really any weight at all. Um, but um, even for someone like me, it was almost cripplingly difficult to put on weight and to feel my body developing and my boobs coming and like my butt, all of that was very difficult. And I think a lot of that is just simply because as you said before, we get so used to being your in this ultra thin body or this thinner body that the brain starts to see that as homeostasis and the brain starts to think that this is, this is normal for me. And it might be for a number of years. And then you put on weight and there's part of your brain. I think Dr. Hill tells me it's the insula is that part of the brain that deals with perception of self that starts going red alert, red alert, red alert. We're not at homeostasis anymore. <laughs> like, and, and the, when, when the body like perceives anything outside of homeostasis as negative and threatening. So it's like that part of your brain is screaming like, ah, 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 curves are coming where they shouldn't be. And that's just because it's different. It's not even necessarily because if you could think clearly, you wouldn't like the way that you are. It's just because it's different. That part of your brain's freaking out. And I think that it takes a while for that part of the brain to then like update and be like, okay, this is the new homeostasis. This is safe now. <laughs> and that's usually like, um, yeah, six months to a year, I think when that part of the brain starts to update for people. And then on top of that, some people do have negative body image and some people, lots of people do have that. And for many people, that is the reason that they went on a diet or lost weight in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think that regardless of however you came about negative body image or that sort of thing, you can still rewire it. And that's why I talk about rewiring neural pathways in the brain as much. You do have to control over the way that your thoughts fire. And so I think that the only thing that you can do, you can't make it, it's never going to be this like take a pill answer to loving your new recovered body. It's not going to happen. But what you can do is you can start countering those neural pathways and stop allowing them to fire. And so a large, and I took a lot of, um, I have a lot of yoga for trauma um, experience. I'm, I've taught that before and I actually ran a nonprofit before which taught um, mindfulness techniques to people like veterans and recoverers, of recoverers from domestic violence and people that have been in trauma. And um, a lot of that is based around just meditation and mindfulness and being able to control your thought patterns and being able to have a thought and not respond to it. So if you imagine that someone's a, an um, army vet, then they might have this response to hearing a loud noise. And so part of the mindfulness practice is trying to keep somebody calm and able to hear the now loud noise, have that fear response, but not jump into that fear response. Mm -hmm. And so in the, we, I use that a lot in recovery. And I think that part of that process is being able to have a thought about your body and then just letting it pass and not jumping into it and believing it and getting round up in it and spiraling out in it, but just being like, oh, there was a thought don't think I'm going to believe that one today moving on you know it's kind of rejecting those thoughts yes which is a process exactly people think that um just because they have their thoughts that they identify as their thoughts and they have to believe every thought that comes into their mind but that's just when you're on autopilot if you bring your awareness back you don't have to believe everything that pops into your right. mind exactly and it's the difference between being able to say I feel disgusting or I am disgusting. And there's a difference there. Just because you feel disgusting does not mean that you are disgusting. It means it's a feeling that you've got in the same way, just because you feel huge does not mean that you are huge. 
and it's being able to sort of like allow it because you can't stop the brain generating emotions and generating thoughts, mm -hmm. but you can stop your reaction to them. And the less energy that you give certain thoughts, the less they will come. It's like, you know, so that's yeah, exactly over time, the more that you work on it, just like with anything, yeah. the more it just becomes natural. Right. Like when you're challenging exactly. any habit, you know, you can break yeah. it. Yeah. There's a, there's an expression in the used in meditation. That's um, where, where your attention goes, energy flows. And it's like, well, the thoughts that you get pay your attention to are the thoughts that will get stronger. And that's really difficult because our brains are designed to be kind of quite convincing and to convince us that our thoughts are true. But it doesn't mean that you have to believe that. And if you can just step back and say, I'm just not going to jump into that thought today and see how that goes. Yeah, exactly. Um, Try it out. Try it out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's a process, though. It's, and then it's, it's definitely one of the hardest parts of recovery, I think, for most people. But it's worth persevering because it gets easier the longer that you stay at your recover, your your body's how happy weight, the exactly. easier it gets to stay there. And you identify your health as being at that weight. It's like, wow, at this weight, like I get this, this, and this. You get so much from it. Mm. You know, so then you identify not as a negative thing as being at that certain body weight, but a great thing. Yeah. Health, yeah. Sustainability and all that. Yeah. So we're coming up on an hour here, like 54 minutes. So we just haven't um, quite answered all of them, but let's see if we can get maybe one or two more in or something. Do you, can you um, differentiate the difference between extreme hunger and binging? Differentiate the difference. I don't know that that's required. Um, well, it, it, I think that I don't even call binging in recovery from restrictive eating disorder binging i'd prefer to call it feast eating because that's all it is it's just a feast that follows a famine yeah. um extreme hunger or, or post-starvation hyperphagia that's like completely appropriate and it happens in majority of mammals i think after a period of starvation they eat a ton of food um i don't think we need to turn that into anything bigger than it is it's just an entirely appropriate response um and not everybody gets extreme hunger, but most people or vast majority gets get it, even if it's just in the form of mental hunger. So that's just as important. It doesn't have to be the extreme physical hunger. Um, I've never met somebody that um, binge eats without the restriction being there. So I don't even really see why, why that's needed yeah. because every single person I've ever met, whether they've had anorexia or not, whatever size body they've been in, they, if they've binge eating, it's because they've been restricting somehow, mm -hmm. which is the irony. Yeah, the extreme com hunger comes from the deprivation, which leads to a binge. Mm -hmm. um, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's an entirely appropriate response by your body if you deprive it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple more. Let's see which. Okay, so do you, can you talk about the difference or like what you recommend um, or what your thoughts are, opinions are, a mini mod method or intuitive eating? Um, I don't know much about mini mods. Um, I think it's basically um, unrestricted eating, which I will always be a huge fan of. <laughs> I know a lot about the Minnesota Starvation Study. Um, and I know a fair amount about the Maudsley as well, family-based treatment. Um, I think that FBT can be adapted to anyone in any situation. It doesn't even have to be family. You can use non-family to be your support system. And I think that really what family-based treatment is, is support, loads of support to, to get better, which I think is a fabulous thing. Um, and where, where you don't even have to use your family to do it. So I think that's great. And then the Minnesota starvation study just showed us that actually eating a shit ton of food after a period of restriction is entirely appropriate, yeah. regardless of you ha if you have anorexia or not. Um, intuitive eating, I, I just really hate that phrase. Yeah. Like I just, just, it's just eating, isn't it? <laughs> like why do we need to call it intuitive eating? It's just eating. We have um, to label everything. So I think it's so that someone can make money out of it and sell a book and say like, this is now a, a thing. Yeah. Just, humans have been eating forever. Let's just call it eating. And the other bit that bugs me about the term intuitive eating is that 
it just makes it, everything, every time I've seen that on a magazine or a meme or anything like that, it's somebody intuitively eating a salad. Whereas I'm like, why isn't there someone just intuitively eating a cheeseburger? Like it, it kind of has that feeling of clean eating around it that I just like. Um, so I, I think that most people, if you just eat, you're intuitively eating. If you don't let all of the nutrition science bullshit kind of like sway you into thinking that there's healthy foods or non-healthy foods. If you can label all food as equal and eat just whatever you want because it feels good, then you're eating intuitively. Exactly. Why? Yeah, let's get away from all of the labels and just call it what it is. Yeah, let's just call it eating. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, so um, before we wrap this up, do you have any last words of wisdom that you could share with the people that are watching? You know, any big tips? What would it be from you? I think that if, yeah, if you're watching YouTube channels and if you're watching YouTube channels on eating disorders, then you probably have an eating disorder. And I think that you, I, I, I know a lot of people sort of watch all these videos, things to feel like they're gearing themselves up to recovery. And it's like, this is not going to gear you up to recovery. Just get out and start eating food and take the action. And it's great to watch recovery stuff, but you have to just hone into your body, your situation right now and do what is right, which is usually eating a ton of food. Amen to that. Just like Nike, like actually Nike has a good slogan. Just do it. Just, do just it. don't eat. Just do it. Yeah. It's never going to feel safe. It's never going to feel right. It's not. Because mm -hmm. if you have an eating disorder, that's the deal. You just do it anyway. Exactly. Feel but like you're going to do it anyway. You've been great fun to talk to. Thank you so much, Tabitha. So are you. You're awesome. You have so much knowledge. I, I love it. I love following your blog and your book and your podcast. So yeah, where can people find all of that? What's um, Yeah, well, my book is kind of like my personal recovery story, which I then like in hindsight, I'm like, that's like, I, so I'm now writing, and I'm just about to publish a book, which is, it's got my personal story in it, but it's also got a lot of my clients' stories and my clients' experts in it. And it's more of a recovery book. Um, and, you know, my blog is at tabithafra.com. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Seriously, you're Russia. helping so many people. I see you on all sorts of different forums and we just need more voices like you and i appreciate what you're doing yeah the same goes for you my dear thank you so much